Good afternoon. I'm Kira Bailey, Assistant Professor in Psychology and Neuroscience and Co-Director of the COVID-19 course, along with Dr. Francesca Nestor in Politics and Government. It's my pleasure to welcome you back for the sixth lecture in our series. Today, we will learn from Dr. Jim Franklin. Dr. Franklin is Professor and Chair of Politics and Government at Ohio Wesleyan. He has published articles in a variety of social science journals, including Comparative Political Studies, International Studies Quarterly, and Political Research Quarterly, where one of his articles was named the best paper of the year in 2009. He is currently pursuing a new research project examining the causes and consequences of democratic revolutions around the world. As a reminder, you can use the chat function to ask questions throughout the presentation. I will select a few for Dr. Franklin to answer after his talk. You can also continue your discussions on the COVID-19 course Facebook group. And now, how are countries responding to COVID-19? Hey, thanks, Kira, for that introduction and also for moderating today. I'm really excited to be part of this course. Um, I think it says a lot about the faculty at Ohio Wesleyan that in the midst of a pandemic, and when we were having to convert courses to uh, online courses and grading things and sometimes doing things we haven't done before, we still managed to um, come together to uh, share our expertise about such an important topic. I think we're all learning a lot uh, by putting together um, our different areas of expertise on this topic. Um, it's also fun, as uh, Laurie Anderson mentioned, uh, we know that we're surrounded by really good teachers, um, but we don't often get to see each other teach. Um, and so this has been fun. Uh, I've, I've watched the, the uh, professors who've uh, been teaching so far, and I plan to watch the rest later on. And finally, uh, I'd like to say hello. I've heard a few of my former students uh, have signed up and hopefully are out there watching today. Uh, my father might also be out there, so hi, Dad. And uh, so now I'll, I'll get started. So my topic is how are countries responding to COVID-19? Okay, I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about my discipline, uh, which explains where I'm coming from with this talk. Okay, so my discipline is comparative politics. So to understand what that is, first we should talk about politics. Uh, most people think of it as something kind of distasteful, but in political science, uh, one common definition is the process by which human communities make collective decisions. Uh, an important thing here is that these are collective decisions. They apply to an entire community, a city, a, a state, or a country. And because of that, not everybody is going to agree with them. Um, they're gonna to apply to people who um, had different points of view. And that's a key aspect of politics is that people disagree about things and conflict is possible. And uh, so that's what we study. And political science is the systematic study of politics and power and government and things like that. Comparative politics is one of the subfields of political science focusing on politics and government within national boundaries. That's what differentiates it from international relations. On Monday, we had an excellent talk by uh, Professor Sean Kay. Uh, his field is international relations. So it's looking more relations between uh, governments, between countries. Now there's gonna be some overlap and uh, Sean and I might uh, touch on a few topics uh, they are the same, but there's also a uh, quite a difference in, in the focus for our talks. Um, and so another part of comparative politics is not just studying politics within national boundaries, but there's the comparative part. Uh, comparing multiple countries uh, gives benefits in research. It allows you to put characteristics of a country in context. So for example, uh, President Trump has said the United States is doing a great job uh, with the coronavirus. Well. It's kind of hard to judge by just looking at the United States, but if we could compare the United States, look at data 
uh, for the United States versus other countries, maybe other similar countries with similar population or similar level of development, we can uh, put those numbers into context. Also, comparative politics, by comparing countries, it allows us to study relationships that you cannot study in just one country. There are some things that are, uh, do not vary within one country. Uh, the example I always use in my classes is there's people in the United States that complain about the two-party system, um, say that, that they would vote if there are more parties to choose from, and that is a question. Uh, if we, the United States had a multi-party system, would more people vote? You can't study that just within the United States because we've always had a two-party system, but you can study uh, the topic by comparing the United States with other countries that have multi-party systems, and then you can look to see does voting turnout vary between the two different systems. Um, a little spoiler alert, it does somewhat. That's not really a topic of, of this talk today. Um, and also by comparing uh, different countries, um, it allows us to examine how different political systems work. We might find that there's whole different uh, political systems at play um, that might explain uh, the differences we see between countries. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the topic at hand, responding to the coronavirus. Okay, so that's experts in public health. They recommend public health policies for dealing with epidemics. And I think we've seen a lot of this uh, the, the mantra seems to be to test, trace, and isolate. So test for the virus, uh, do contract, contact tracing to find out uh, who those people who test positive have come into contact with, isolate those people so it, the virus cannot spread to more people. Also, there's recommendations of shutting down large gatherings. And if all this fails, all else fails, then uh, we see stay-at-home orders. Uh, to just to try to keep people from intermingling too much to slow down the spread of the virus. Now, I will admit, I'm not an expert in uh, public health policy. That's not really where I'm coming from with my talk here. Although I will say, I think all of us have gotten a crash course on public health policy because of the pandemic. And we see uh, Dr. Fauci uh, talk about the the strategies for slowing down spread of, of uh, the, the virus. In Ohio, we have Dr. Amy Acton, who's been uh, giving daily uh, presentations about health policies in Ohio. So I think we've all learned a lot that way. But really, I see my contribution uh, to this course is looking more at the next two points here. Because experts recommend public health policies, but then politics gets involved. Uh, political leaders, they may follow the public health recommendations, but they may not. They may decide to weigh public health concerns against economic concerns and their own political interests. Political leaders may believe that following public health policies may actually hurt their uh, political interests, especially in an election year. Also, citizens may or may not cooperate in public health policies. And I think we've seen examples, which I'll talk a little more about lately, uh, later, I mean, where uh, people do not participate. Um, and citizens themselves, they may themselves weigh public health concerns against other priorities, other concerns, especially economic concerns in this situation. And also some political systems are more capable of implementing large scale policies than others. So there may be something else more fundamental going on. If you look around the world, there are some countries that do a really good job with a wide variety of different things. And Denmark is often uh, seen as, as a model of, of this type of country. Um, but there's Sweden, New Zealand, there, there's other countries. They rank really highly in almost every good thing. Um, so they're, they're highly democratic, they're great human rights records, they have um, low levels of corruption, uh, their income per capita is high, their overall health of society is high, uh, you can go on and on and on. 
Um, and there's other countries that score very poorly at all of these variables. And so that suggests maybe it's not just about policy in one particular area. Maybe there's something more fundamental going on. There's certain types of political systems that work well, and there's other types of political systems that are just dysfunctional in, in pretty much any area uh, you look at. So I'll look a little bit at different political systems here in this lecture. And two of the most fundamental variables when we look at different political systems, one is the regime type. And here are the basic differences between authoritarian regimes and democratic regimes. I think most people know what uh, democracy versus authoritarian regimes are. Basically, authoritarian regimes are non-democratic, so that's pretty easy. Uh, within the democratic category, we could break it down more. There are liberal democracies, which not only have um, competitive elections to select leaders, but also uh, political leaders are constrained uh, by other institutions, uh, by constitutions, by a rule of law. Um, leaders uh, are required to protect individual rights, and so there are limits beyond which even an elected government cannot go. So those are liberal democracies. There's other countries that have competitive elections, but uh, they don't have some of the, all those same protections, and they are sometimes called illiberal democracies. And within the authoritarian category, we have fully authoritarian regimes where they don't even make any real pretense of democracy, but more and more common, we have authoritarian regimes where they have some of the trappings of democracy. They, they, they have elections, but they're not truly competitive elections, and they're often called competitive uh, authoritarian regimes. Okay, the other main variable here is state capacity. Um, this, this looks at how capable states are of doing the things um, that we uh, think that goes along with, with governments, like uh, providing order and, and stability and things like that. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Okay, so to get to the coronavirus then. Um, I'm sure you all know that it uh, began in China. Uh, patients with a mysterious form of pneumonia were appearing in the city of Wuhan, China by mid-December 2019. Um, it spread rapidly, infecting over 80,000 and killing over 4,000, which is the official statistics. Now people have questioned that I uh, posted a uh, YouTube video on the, uh, the readings uh, for this, for my uh, lecture of the course. Uh, it's a, a video by a, a Chinese dissident, uh, Yang Jianli, and he cites some evidence that the, the death toll in Wuhan may have been actually as high as maybe even 40,000, much higher. Um, but what is uh, well known, um, I think most people agree on, is that the infection was uh, spreading rapidly, but uh, China imposed a drastic lockdown uh, in really the whole country, but especially severe within, uh, the, within Wuhan and, and the uh, districts around Wuhan. It was something akin to um, a, um, a lockdown order, um, house arrest, really, for a great part of the population. Um, people were not allowed to leave their homes, except if people uh, had fevers or signs of infection, they would be taken away from the home. I think it was, uh, even if they, no matter whether they wanted to leave or not, they were taken away and tested, and if they tested positive, they were uh, separated. Um, so it was, um, a very harsh type of a quarantine lockdown policy that was put in place, but it did work. And COVID-19 cases uh, peaked on February 12th and declined substantially by early March. And so China was able to contain uh, the spread of this virus. So is this a victory for the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, this is the way the Chinese Communist Party has portrayed this uh, as a victory for their political system. 
and there are propaganda videos uh, which they have made. Uh, the YouTube video, which I, uh, again, I uh, linked on, on the, uh, my page for this lecture, uh, it starts off with one of these propaganda videos. The uh, photo here is of uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping visiting Wuhan. And there was a great photo op there, him waving up. There's these people in apartment buildings waving and cheering for him. Of course, in the, the video I linked, it, it showed evidence people with their phone videos show they're actually police officers within people's apartments making sure they cheered uh, when Xi Jinping visited. And the, uh, the Chinese dissident in that video makes the point that people were not all that happy really with uh, the Chinese government because the, uh, the conditions in Wuhan were very harsh. Um, but the graph here shows that uh, China was able to contain uh, the, the spread of disease relative to uh, these other countries, many of which are uh, other you know, highly developed countries, more highly developed even than China. Okay, so in one way of looking at it, it was a victory. Uh, for China, and they were successful at containing uh, the virus. But there was a critical delay. Wuhan health officials were told there was this new coronavirus on December 26th, but that didn't get out to the public. Uh, on December 30th, uh, Li Wenliang, a, a doctor at Wuhan Central Hospital, uh, they were dealing with people with this virus. And he and some others went online because the officials were not getting the word out about this. So they went online and posted uh, about, about this virus uh, to let the, the public know. And he and the others were reprimanded for spreading rumors. Uh, the, the, there's a photo here of, of Dr. Li Wenwing. He uh, actually later died uh, uh, at, at, in the hospital wor working with patients of the coronavirus. So, so he's, he's seen as a hero who gave his life in fighting the spread of the disease and also for having the courage to speak out in a uh, political system where that is not encouraged. And we see that he was reprimanded for that. Um, officials downplayed or covered up information about the, the coronavirus until January 21st, when the People's Daily, which is the big official newspaper, finally mentioned the epidemic. Meanwhile, during this time, not only was it spreading within Wuhan and around that area, but thousands of people traveled on airplanes outside of Wuhan, and it started spreading around the world. And this tendency to hide negative news is typical in authoritarian regimes. Um, that there's a long history of this, that especially if, they, if the government controls the official media, they will ignore or spin negative news or blame it on some other country or enemies. Um, and they have censors in China to, to keep an eye on online posts, which, which we saw with the case of this doctor. Um, so that's a potential problem with authoritarian regimes dealing with something like this, is the tendency to just try to sweep it under the rug and instead of uh, dealing with it forthright. Okay, so democracy in pandemics. Um, so the Chinese state used its immense powers to contain the virus. So uh, having these strong authoritarian powers was useful in containing the virus, but that's uh, three points here. So as Fukuyama points out in the article that I uh, linked for this lecture, democracies have also summoned immense executive power during times of crisis. So think about the United States during World War II, when the federal government basically uh, took over management uh, of the economy uh, to make sure that all the, the armaments that were needed were being produced and, and sent to the right place. 
Uh, so Fukuyama does not think that regime type is actually a critical variable. He doesn't think that's going to be the main factor that uh, determines whether a country is successful or unsuccessful in dealing with this pandemic. Uh, so another point is uh, many authoritarian regimes are corrupt and incapable of doing what China did. China is a very, very strong state, um, which another thing we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but not all authoritarian regimes actually have strong states. A lot of them are very corrupt. Um, so even if they wanted to, they would not be capable of stopping uh, the spread of a virus like this. And furthermore, some of the model cases in fighting COVID-19 are democracies, including South Korea, Taiwan, and New Zealand. They're not all democracies. For example, Vietnam is earning praise for uh, its efforts to stop the spread of the coronavirus, and it's an authoritarian regime. So it's not all democracies, but some democracies have done quite well. So look a little bit more closely at Taiwan. Uh, with a population of 23 million, Taiwan was expected to have the second highest number of cases of the coronavirus because it's, you see on the map here, it's very close to China geographically. Also, there's a long history linking the people of Taiwan to uh, mainland China, and there's a lot of travel and economic ties uh, between the two. However, as of May 6, when I looked up the data, Taiwan has had 439 cases of COVID-19 and six deaths. Um, so that's a really remarkable success story uh, in stopping containing uh, this virus. So how did they do it? Uh, I linked an article from the Journal of the American Medical Association that looked in detail at what Taiwan did. Here's my summary of that. In 2004, after the SARS outbreak, SARS was another coronavirus which uh, spread, especially in East Asia, um, the National Health Command Center was established in Taiwan to oversee their efforts uh, in future epidemics. As part of this process, critical supplies like face masks were stockpiled so that they would be ready. Uh, beginning on December 31st, 2019, Taiwanese officials began boarding arriving planes to screen passengers who had been to Wuhan. So notice this is before even China, the People's Republic of China had started doing anything about the coronavirus in, in uh, Wuhan. Taiwan was already uh, going uh, into implementing these policies to contain it. Also in Taiwan, uh, officials integrated travel information with medical information to help find people who might have COVID-19. So for example, if somebody uh, went to the doctor and had a fever um, and tested negative for the flu, they might check their travel records and see, oh, this person had been to Wuhan. Uh, let's give them the, the test for, uh, for COVID-19 and isolate this person. In Taiwan, uh, government officials track cell phones to make sure people are staying in quarantine, and they also use that for contact tracing so they can see somebody who wound up being positive for coronavirus went into a cafe so they can try to find people who were also in that cafe at the same time. So it is, there is some infringement in that government officials are watching people's cell phones, but people there seem to accept that as part of process of keeping them healthy. Also, uh, finally in Taiwan, uh, there's a series of local officials who check in on people in quarantine. They call and make sure that they are actually staying in quarantine. They are providing them with food and medicine. One article said that sometimes people just want to talk. They're kind of bored being stuck in their apartments. And so sometimes they just ask these officials just to talk to them for a while. But anyway, they have uh, a uh, bureaucracy that helps to enforce these policies. Okay, now on to state capacity. Effectively fighting a pandemic is difficult. It probably requires high state capacity. The term state here refers to the set of institutions that have recognized authority over a defined territory. 
In the United States, we probably just call this the government. In many other countries, um, the term government has a much narrower meaning, so they, they, the term state is a more general term that's more often used in political science. States keep law and order, defend against external threats, and provide infrastructure and other public goods and services. High capacity states do all these things fairly well. Um, but, it, but of course, low capacity states don't do them very well. At the lowest end are what we call fail states, which are just incapable of doing uh, most of these things, if not all of these things. Okay, the table I have here is one effort to measure state capacity. It's called the Fragile States Index. And I uh, showed here, I show here one component of this index that measures provision of public services, including infrastructure and health. And it's a fragile states index, so the higher the score, the more fragile or the less the state uh, capability. It goes from zero to 10. So the most capable state on public services is Finland, coming in at 0 0.7, so the United States is at 1.2, uh, China 5.1, and uh, the Central African Republic is the worst at 10.0. So pretty much judged to be incapable of providing uh, these basic services. Okay, so, we have basically a hypothesis here that uh, countries with high capacity states are more able to uh, respond to the challenge of coronavirus and low capacity states would be less able to respond. Okay, well, if we just look at current infection rates or death rates, it, would, it seems to contradict the hypothesis. For example, Central African Republic, remember that was the a country was deemed as having the least capability of providing public services. Uh, data I looked up last week uh, has Central African Republic with only 94 infections and zero deaths. So are they doing a great job? Um, the data so far would seem to indicate that. Um, in fact, if you look at a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you see countries uh, with low infection rates and low death rates, which is kind of surprising if, since a lot of them are, are lower capacity states. Uh, some have suggested that populations in these types of countries are more resistant to, to the coronavirus because they are younger. These countries have uh, uh, lower life expectancies. And also these people, the people in these countries have been exposed to more frequent epidemics in the past. There's some suggest that maybe uh, vaccination that they get to another type of virus actually gives them protection to coronavirus. So it, this could be, these are explanations for if these data are legitimate, then these are reasons why maybe these countries are having less of a problem than we would expect. However, uh, it could be that the data are not correct or maybe they're not correct yet. We, we might see things change in the future. It seems that coronavirus has spread most rapidly to globally connected countries. So it may take longer for it to reach less connected countries. So these countries that are sitting pretty right now, they may actually have much greater problem moving forward. I think we saw this, you could say in the United States where the places get hit the first, we're more globally connected areas like New York City. Um, and then more recently, we see uh, the virus spreading into more rural areas, so we could see a similar pattern around the world. Also, low capacity countries have very little capa capability to test for COVID-19 or count the number of deaths associated with it. So they could be uh, severely undercounting the actual problem. So, so far, evidence does not support the state capacity hypothesis, but I think it's likely to be a factor going forward. How about high capacity states? Some have done pretty well, Finland and Germany, for example. However, several fairly high capacity countries have been overwhelmed by COVID-19, like Italy, Spain, Belgium, United Kingdom, and the United States. Clearly having a high capacity state is not enough. It must be used wisely. As a drummer, I have the uh, analogy that you could buy the best drum set in the world, but if you don't know how to play it, it's not gonna sound good. So, 
even having a high capacity state and a sophisticated uh, a medical infrastructure may not work if the policies are not right or it's not led well. So this is where political decisions by leaders and political attitudes and behavior of the public become important. Okay, so the United States is a high capacity state and was considered the country most prepared for a pandemic in the 2019 Global Health Security Index. However, the US response has fallen short. Um, President Trump downplayed the risk. Uh, the federal government was very slow at getting testing out. Uh, basically, if you look at all the different things I mentioned that worked well in Taiwan to contain it, those things were not being done, or were at least were not being done well in the United States. Um, so that points to perhaps a failure of leadership uh, with President Trump. Um, however, um, looking more broadly, I should point out that President Trump is not alone in having uh, a uh, problematic response to, to the challenge. Uh, President Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil has downplayed the severity of COVID-19, says, says it's just like a little flu. He fired his health minister who was trying to implement uh, public health policies. And also there have been protests against the lockdowns in Brazil and actually Jair Bolsonaro personally went, uh, took part in, in at least one of these protests. Um, so may, it's, perhaps it's not just one individual leader, but perhaps certain types of leaders are ill-equipped for leading in a crisis. So that brings me to the topic of populism. Populist politicians claim to represent the people against corrupt elites. That's their, their style, their campaigning style. Um, populists can be on the left. There's been a lot of leftist populists in Latin America, like Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. But the recent surge in Western countries have been what some people call right-wing, or I think more accurately we call nationalistic populists. They um, are often concerned with immigration and they oppose immigration. Uh, there's off in Europe, there's uh, opposition to the European Union and some other countries, crime, cracking down really harshly on crime is, is a major issue. Now, populists can have positive and negative effects. On the positive side, populists champion groups who feel left out. So that's an important thing in a democracy. You know, there should be representation uh, for all the different citizens in society. But on the negative side, populists often portray experts, at least in, in, the, in the West especially, they often portray experts as part of the elite who cannot be trusted. Uh, populists polarize politics. Instead of looking for solutions, seeking to compromise with different groups, seeking to unify people. Uh, they polarize politics, that's their style. They wanna find en enemies and blame uh, elites and, and things like that. And so that tends to drive polarization and division in society. Also, populists tend to be highly personalistic. Instead of trying to build up institutions or uh, a political party, they have a very top-down approach. Uh, it's all really about the people following their lead. Uh, they expect uh, loyalty uh, from people. And so that can lead them, again, to get rid of independent voices uh, within their party or within uh, the bureaucracy because they want loyalty. So I think you can see how these three aspects could lead to some of the problems of leadership we've seen, where they don't uh, leaders faced with this pandemic, they don't try to seek out expert opinion, they don't try to unify the country, they don't try to build up stronger uh, institutions and uh, agencies for dealing with, with the challenges. This table here shows, this is from a recent study that uh, identifies populists in power. We see Donald Trump is listed as one, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who I mentioned from Brazil, and uh, several others. Some of, the, some of the most prominent deniers uh, that COVID-19 was a serious problem, like in Brazil, 
and uh, Nicaragua are people on this list. Okay, so leadership, especially populist leadership, may be part of the problem. But um, the leaders got there for with because they had support of the people. So is there something with the people themselves or with society that explains what's going on? So let's look at popular attitudes and behavior. Okay, some people have looked at how uh, success cases in East Asia, maybe there's a different culture there uh, that made, made them more effective at dealing with uh, the pandemic than in Western culture. In the 90s, there was a pretty prominent debate called the Asian values debate. It was pushed by, especially by uh, leaders in Singapore. They argued that uh, Asia has a more collectivist culture where you balance individual rights against what's important, what's needed for the community. Whereas in Western culture, it's all about individualism, about individual rights. So this perhaps could explain why there's more protests um, in the United States with a more individualistic culture. But we need to also look at evidence here. The evidence is mixed. There's some support of more uh, collectivist or communitarian values in, in Asian culture, but um, not all of the so-called Asian values really hold up when you look at data. There's also a lot of differences within Asian countries. There's a lot of differences within Western countries. And really, this is a global issue. This is not just Asia versus the West. Um, so I think it's important to go beyond just comparisons of Asian culture versus Western culture. Uh, in the article I linked, uh, Fukuyama, he looks a little more broadly. He thinks that attitudes are important, but he looks more broadly. He thinks the effective use of power depends on broad trust. It's important to have a broad sense of trust in society. And he argues this is lacking in the United States. Uh, Trump supporters don't trust the mainstream media or a lot of the uh, medical experts at, right now. And then other people who are not Trump supporters don't trust Trump. And so there's this division and distrust in society. So it makes it harder to have a unified, effective response to a crisis like the coronavirus. This relates to a prominent argument by Robert Putnam. Uh, he did a study of, uh, uh, of state-level government, governance within Italy, and he found that some governments were much more effective than others, and his conclusion was that democratic governance is more effective where there's a sense of community with broad social trust, and when that's lacking, government becomes much more dysfunctional. Uh, there's another study on in India by Varshney. He was looking at different rates of rioting uh, between Muslims and Hindus, which sounds like totally unrelated to what we're talking about, but I think it could be related. Um, he found that there are certain parts of India which have frequent uh, violence between uh, Muslims and Hindus and other areas where they just don't. And he argued that the difference is kind of similar. There's sort of a sense of community. There are bonds that link different groups together and that where those are present, then uh, people get along better. Where that's lacking, then he po pointed out that you have leaders and media who engage in conspiracy theories in order to drive up the, the anger, uh, to get people riled up uh, for their own political benefit or to get people to buy their newspaper or whatever. And I think we can see some of that. We, we've seen a lot of conspiracy theories spreading around about the, the real cause of the coronavirus and, and things like that. Um, and so again, the, the point is if you have a society is more uh, connected together by associations and, and sense of trust, then you're less likely to have those types of things uh, be um, spread and respected by very many people. So is this lack of trust and, and is this maybe hyper polarization, is this hampering the response in the United States? Now, the majorities have shown, been shown in surveys to support the shutdown. So in one way, the United Americans are fairly unified, but there's also local opposition. And I have on here uh, pictures of, of protests 
Uh, we've seen lots of protests across the United States. The bottom photo is the protest in Brazil. That's President uh, Bolsonaro in the front. There's also been protests across Europe. So clearly there is a, a very vocal opposition um, that is opposed to the, the, the uh, lockdown or shutdown orders in response to coronavirus. And also this raises the question, will fighting the coronavirus, will having kind of this common enemy, will it lead to greater unity or could it just lead to even greater division? Okay, a few final reflections here. Um, first of all, of all, it's too early to make any firm conclusions. Uh, like I've said before, I think the data will change over time. Um, and so we need to wait and see how the, uh, the virus spreads before we have the data. Um, controlling COVID-19 is very difficult uh, for any government to, to contain. Even very capable governments like Germany uh, they managed to keep the death toll down, but it's still spreading pretty widely uh, within that country. Countries have, that have done the best had a plan and acted very swiftly. And so Taiwan's an example of this, South Korea as well. Some of these countries had recent experience with epidemics, with uh, SARS. Uh, shutting down the economy is very painful. It helps if people trust the policymakers and if politicians work together in order to build up that trust and have a sense that we're all in this together and this is something we need to do in order to uh, help you know, stop the spread of the disease and save people's lives. Um, and I think it will probably be especially bad if or when outbreaks happen in low capacity states. And these countries will need help from more developed countries. Basically, it will take a lot more research looking at all kinds of different angles. Um, I think it'll be an interesting thing to look at, maybe a future senior seminar, maybe it's something we could look at. All right, well, I'll stop there and uh, let it open up to uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. And we have a lot of great questions from the audience. So I'm gonna start with the big million dollar question. Um, one thing that people wanna know is which lessons we should be taking from other countries that are handling this better than us, or I guess in other words, which strategies could be effectively applied in the US. And I wanna give you just a couple of examples of specific ones that the audience asked about. Um, so they mentioned, um, the, is home quarantine effective or would group quarantine facilities work better? Um, is cell phone tracking actually effective or is that kind of a system that's too easy for people to beat by just like not taking their cell phones with them? So those were a couple of the specifics, but if you could speak to any strategies that you think could be effectively applied here that we're not already doing, that would be great. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the, the easiest answer is we should have done what Taiwan and South Korea did right from the start, and we didn't. Um, and that's one thing that's pretty apparent here. If a country has a plan, they are ready, they are ready to jump into action right away, um, like Taiwan and South Korea did, then you can contain it, and then you don't have to shut down the entire economy. Um, but we didn't do that, and the United States is not alone. Most countries uh, were not able to contain it the same way that Taiwan and South Korea did. So then what do you do? That's, that's, that's the question then. Um, and again, I'm, you know, public health is not my expertise, but just looking at you know, what the lessons we're getting from the experts is we need to build up testing capacity and that's something, there was a Senate hearing yesterday, that's something that was a bipartisan position with, among the senators is we really need to get testing capacity up and there are efforts to do that. Um, it's been slow, there's been bottlenecks. If you can get that up and we can start testing more, then you can hopefully start doing quarantines that are more specific instead of having to just try to you know, shut everything down. You can try to find who actually has the virus quarantine them, find their contacts. Um, I think that the cell phone tracking, um, that's probably will have to be part of how you do that. 
um, there's some estimate that you need some, you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of, of human contact tracers to really do an effective job of that with a population of over 300 million. Um, so having these uh, technologies with cell phones, that can be helpful. Now, legally, can we force people to download an app to have their phone tracked? I don't know. That I think there's serious uh, civil liberties concerns there. It would go to courts. I don't know what the answer would be. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a legal scholar either, um, but I know that it would, people would challenge that. I do know that. Um, and probably you couldn't force people to do that. And so not everybody would download that app. Um, so there's gonna be holes in, in those types of efforts because of that. So to sort of follow up on something that you just mentioned, the audience was having a little bit of a conversation about uh, why mass testing programs have not been started in the US. And so I'm wondering if you might be able to speak to some of the barriers preventing our country from distributing tests more broadly. Okay, why mass testing has not taken off? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, it, it seems like they just announced that there's this new uh, antigen testing. Um, again, that, this, this is not my field of expertise, but from what they're saying, this will allow testing to start to ramp up it's something that's that should be faster and quicker. I believe with the uh, the the standard testing they had at first, it took a long time. You have to have enough swabs um, in order to to take the samples. Um, you have to have people with all the proper uh, PPE equipment to 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 safely take those samples, and we just didn't have the infrastructure, from my understanding, to really do high number of tests. Uh, there's antibody tests, um, but that there's been uh, problems in the quality of that. And the the first uh, early testing, um, the the government wanted to really keep control over the testing, but then the, the test they came out with was botched. Uh, with the uh, antibody testing, they kind of took the opposite approach, kind of a laissez-faire, let anybody come up with antibody testing, but then there's the quality issues there, and there's some that came out that um, have a lot of errors in the results, so that has also slowed it down. So, um, so it's just a difficult process uh, to get testing out, but it looks like there, there's some promise that, that the testing can ramp up more in the future. Let's hope that's true. Yes, so that also leads nicely into another question from the audience. Um, so, I, you know, I think that a lot of the things that you just mentioned about why it's hard to get mass testing ramped up also have to do with the size of our nation. And so it's certainly true that a lot of the countries that, um, that you mentioned and that we're comparing to the U.S. are smaller. And so one of the audience members asked how, if you know, if any of our states compare to those smaller countries? So are there individual states that are maybe t doing a better job in containing COVID-19 than maybe our entire country is? Yeah, that's a good point, is that a lot of the countries that seem to be doing really well are small. Many of them are islands. Um, or South Korea is not an island, but it borders on a closed state um, with closed borders already. So, so that does give them an advantage. It's easier to contain the spread of a virus um, if you are an island. And if you're a small country, uh, you don't have to get as much testing capacity. It may be you only have one or two international airports, so it's easier to screen passengers. Um, so I think size is helpful for these, these countries that have done a, a nice job with having they have smaller populations. Now, these are also high capacity states. So they, these are countries that are they're fairly wealthy, fairly well developed, have strong states and small populations. So that's, that's a lot easier uh, to deal with than if you have over 300 million people in the United States or over a billion people uh, in India, where I think there's they're gonna face a lot of challenges. Um, and so looking at the United States, that 
can be a useful analogy. And it does seem that there are some states that have uh, more uh, aggressive policies uh, to deal to, with uh, the spread of, of the virus. Uh, Washington state seems to have done a good job. There was the first state that was hit, but it seems like they've had a, a pretty sharp decline. Um, there are places like Ohio has had strong leadership on this. Um, other states did not really do um, the, the shutdowns or opened up very, very early, um, earlier than the government, govern, the government guidance would suggest. Um, but even here in the United States, it's not quite the same because we have open borders between the states. Um, so we can't really contain it as well as like a New Zealand or an Iceland. Thank you. So another question, well, actually there were several questions having to do with China. Um, so one of them that I thought was interesting is what role do you think China played in downplaying the success of Taiwan? If Taiwan actually had a seat in the World Health Organization, would Taiwan strategies be better shared and implemented to control the pandemic? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, Taiwan is not a member of the World Health organization because Taiwan is not a member of the United Nations. And that goes back, I don't know, I don't want to get too deep in, into the, the history of this, but Taiwan was founded um, after the, the end of the civil war in China. There was the, the battle between the nationalists and the communists for power in China. The nationalists had been in power, but the communists won. So they took over Beijing and they uh, took over most of what is China called it the People's Republic of China. The nationalists fled to Taiwan, and they, they claimed that they were the legitimate government of China, even though they only governed this little island. But they, they called themselves the Republic of China, and they were actually the uh, representative for China in the United Nations. Uh, but that changed in the late 70s. And so there's a, a massive turnaround. So suddenly, the People's Republic of China became the official representative uh, for China in the United Nations and Taiwan suddenly became the state that was no longer recognized. And uh, the People's Republic of China argues that Taiwan is just a province of China. Um, and so they, they fight very hard against, um, rhetorically speaking, against any kind of recognition of Taiwan as an independent state. Now, in reality, Taiwan is an independent state. They have their own economy, they have a military, they have their own democracy, um, but um, China will not accept any recognition of that by other countries. And so part of them being shunned by the United Nations means they're shunned by the World Health Organization. And so Taiwan has not gotten the aid of the World Health Organization. Some have argued that it actually was good for Taiwan because the World Health Organization, by as all arms of the United Nations, I mean, these are political bodies. Uh, they are institutions, their members are states or countries, and some countries have a lot of pull, like China and the United States have a lot of pull. And so they can put pressure on UN agencies to um, respect their point of view. And, um, and so China was covering up about the, the details of the, the coronavirus. And so that was being withheld from the, from the World Health Organization. They're under some kind of political constraints from pushing too hard on China. Um, whereas Taiwan, they didn't have to worry about that. They, they were tracking it themselves. Um, they seemed actually ahead of the Chinese the government and, and knowing about what was going on, or at least being open about what was going on with, with the coronavirus. And so some have suggested it was actually good that they weren't even in World Health Organization because they could just do their own thing. Um, I don't know. I, I think it would, be, it would be good. They should be part of the World Health Organization. I think they have a lot to teach other countries. And, you know, they are a country in the world and they are affected by viruses and, and other health uh, events. And so I think they should be a, a, a member of that. So my final question is, uh, should the UN be playing a stronger role in coordinating the world's efforts to collect accurate data and respond to the spread of COVID-19? 
We had several of members of the audience ask about UN's response to China and should they be sanctioned, um, as well as, um, you know, just this idea of some countries maybe aren't getting accurate data out to the rest of the world. And so do you think the UN has a bigger role to play there? Or is there something else, some other body that should be helping us do that? Yeah, I mean, the UN should uh, urge for accurate data from the different countries. But I mean, the United Nations is kind of limited. It, 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 it is limited in imposing sanctions. And it won't impose sanctions on China because China has a veto um, within the, the Security Council, which is the governing body of the United Nations. And so that there will not be any sanctions on China uh, coming from the United Nations. Also, the United States is not, with the Trump administration does not have much faith in the United Nations. And so they're not, I don't think they're gonna try to use the United Nations as a forum to try to, to push um, policies uh, as much as maybe could be done. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, there, there should be efforts to try to encourage um, better reporting. I think that the world system is just kind of in disarray right now. Um, the United States, uh, United States is not showing strong leadership, which Professor Kay pointed out really well last time. Uh, the United States is not really providing a leadership role. Uh, President Trump has more of a, let's focus on America first, uh, policy. Um, but, you know, this is one of those areas when you have a pandemic, you know, that shows that we are all connected. Uh, you can't just isolate yourself uh, and and not deal with the rest of the world because the rest of the world, what happens there affects everybody. Um, so that's one question. Will this lead to greater cooperation between countries? I would hope so. On the other hand, this could actually fuel nationalism even more. People could say, well, look, I mean, what ha what's coming from other countries threatens our lives. So we need to build more barriers to other countries. Um, and so you might see nationalist movements and, and leaders, they might push even harder on building more barriers because of the fear that they could use the coronavirus as an example of why you need to do that. So I think, I don't know which way it's gonna go. I think it could go either direction for that. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Franklin, for sharing your time and knowledge with us. And thank you to the audience for once again asking excellent questions. And don't forget that you can continue your conversations on the Facebook group. Another way to continue the conversation is the Meet the Professor sessions. Students who have registered for course credit can join us tomorrow at 4 p.m. in Blackboard Collaborate. And community members can join us at noon on Friday in Blackboard Collaborate. The RSVP links were sent in a previous email, but if you have any questions, please contact us at covidcoursecoordinator at owu.edu. See you again soon.